Greg Lusselt. I'm chair of Santa Barbara SCORE, and I have with me my colleague, Eric Saltzman, which is my vice chair at Santa Barbara SCORE. It's a pleasure us to meet and to discuss this with you. Oh, we're moving right on. Let's go to disclaimer. So Eric and I have done our very best to gather material extremely quickly on what this bill all contains. And we're gonna go over as much as possible we can this evening. We're also gonna to try to do another presentation a week from today to go in more detail. We also encourage you to seek out a SCORE mentor and legal or county advice in addition to what you hear tonight. And we want to make sure you understand what we give tonight is not uh, anything you should make decisions on. Please seek out other advisors. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so we got some great news. The bill finally got signed. And we're going to talk tonight about key aspects of the bill. There are some changes to the current Triple P, um, the application. There we have a, a Triple P 2.0. We'll talk a little about what that is. There is a new EIDL available. We'll talk some changes in tax benefits, which are all positive for everyone. And there's some implications to the seven, uh, this, if you have a uh, SBA 7A or 504 microloan payments, there's some good changes there that are positive. And then we'll go into probably what I'll do is very fast individual benefits. And we'll probably go in much more detail next week. And then there is a new grant available, the California Small Business Grant, which opens up uh, tomorrow the 30th for applications. So let's get started. Next page, please. Okay. So I think the, the I'm gonna just do a quick summary. It, this thing, we have direct payments to many Americans. That's part of a key part of the bill. We have extended federal eviction prohibition, a key part of the bill. We have a couple of different relief programs for gig workers and for non-gig workers that have been extended. And then we have this triple P and, and triple P has a couple parts. I think the most important part of this, now there's some changes to the old triple P about, can you select eight or 24? For most of everyone here, that probably doesn't matter. The last time you could get a triple P was August 9th. So if you got it August 9th, you're probably in a week 11 now. And for most of us will be well past, I'm assuming about week 20 for one now, for most of us will be well past the 24 period. But Eric, what are the two key parts in these changes to the old Triple P that are important for us to know about? So the two key parts here are, first of all, um, they have eliminated the requirement that the EIDL grant get deducted from the amount eligible for PPP forgiveness. So you can now get full forgiveness on your PPP loan, even if you've gotten an EIDL grant. Um, so that can be... Yeah, Eric, we're going to make it clear. So if I got a triple P for 25000 and an EDL for 5000 it used to be this whole confusing thing where I got 100% forgiveness, but it still meant I owed 5000 right? Exactly. Now you get full forgiveness and you don't owe that 5000 That's great news. Okay. And the second piece, which um, will apply if you've not yet uh, submitted your application for forgiveness and your loan is $150,000 or less, probably want to sit tight uh, for a little while until the government releases this new simplified forgiveness application because it's specified in the law to be a one-page application that requires uh, minimal certification and documentation to achieve <clears throat> full forgiveness. And that will make your life a lot easier if you have not already applied for forgiveness and you fall into the less than 150K bucket. And as soon as that comes out, we'll have a webinar on that and go through line by line what that forgiveness application is and, and, and certainly uh, uh, talk to your SCORE mentor about that. Next slide, please. Okay. We, as I said to begin with, for most of this, you get some new expenses covered, not covered. We assume that the majority of folks on this call are well beyond their 24-week period. And Eric, if I'm beyond my 24 week period, should I go back and redo my expenses or does this matter to me? So unless you were coming up short on expenses to achieve full forgiveness, no, you should ignore this uh, as an existing PPP loaner, uh, borrower and just go ahead with applying or uh, leaving your application as it is. The big win here is if you're going to apply for a new PPP loan and you're in an industry that has um, a lot of expenses for 
supplies uh, or ingredients like a restaurant might have, for example, uh, or you had to do, you have to spend money on personal protective equipment for your employees, um, things of that nature, because you can now include those uh, in your eligible expenses under a PPP loan that you might get. And that will make it much easier for certain businesses to utilize the full funds and achieve forgiveness. So Eric, if I have lots of pieces and parts in my cost of goods sold, materials that I make my, my product with, I can now include those under, uh, under the new triple P, is that correct? Uh, yes, now there has, there's um, some requirement that needs to be clarified. And, and I will say, I suspect as with the first go around, we're going to see a number of clarifying uh, documents come out from the government um, as to when those expenses need to be occurred um, for something. And I, I focused on restaurants because I've seen specific language. If it's perishable, it can be incurred during the forgiveness period. If it's dura more durable uh, parts and components, um, there may be some obligation that you actually entered into contracts to purchase those um, prior to the start of the forgiveness period. So we'll wait for clarification on that one. So stay tuned. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, now this Triple P 2.0 has two buckets. One bucket is for if you have a Triple P currently, you received one, and the other bucket is for people that have never gotten a Triple P. So one thing that everyone hated about the Triple P was all these publicly traded and rich companies that were getting Triple P money that didn't need it. And, uh, you know, and it was a whole uproar about that. So the rules have been changed to try to eliminate and make sure it goes to the folks that really need it and make sure it goes to small businesses. And I think that's most of the changes here, Eric, but maybe you can go over, let's go first with the example. I've gotten a triple P already. I got, I've, I've gone through my forgiveness. I haven't received forgiveness, but I've spent it all by July. And now I can get another one. Is that what? Are, well, how do I get another one, Eric? So you go back to your existing lender um, and apply with that existing lender, and it should be under the guidelines a very streamlined process. Um, the first uh, point here is exactly the same calculation used before for loan amount, uh, and I'm going to come to an exception on one of the subsequent slides. But it's two and a half times the average monthly payroll with a cap of. Two and a half million, which goes back to Greg's comment on big business. Um, you have to have 300 or less employees, which is obvious. Uh, we talked about having used your original loan. The big difference here is you have to show need, and they define need as a 25% uh, decline in gross revenue in any quarter of 2020 compared to the same quarter in 2019. So it doesn't mean you had to make less money, have less gross revenue overall for the year. Let's say the second quarter of 2020, which was the one where COVID first hit, you had a big drop off in your business and you did less than you did in the second quarter of 2019 by at least 25%. That would make you eligible, even if you add up the full year and you came out ahead compared to the prior year. So you just need to find one quarter year over year with a 25% um, loss and make sure you do that on a cash basis. And when you're in QuickBooks uh, and you're trying to generate reports, make sure you select cash basis because it'll default to accrual. And if you have year over year drop, you're eligible. Okay, Eric, I had a couple questions for you. So any quarter in 2020, including Q1? Any quarter in 2020 is the way okay. the language is drafted, yes. And let's use that example of what you had. You know, I had a bad Q2, but then business kind of picked up and it was pretty darn good. In fact, so good that I hired more employees. And so by Q4, I had five more employees in my company. That two and a half monthly payroll, do I use the my new payroll, which is going to be greater than my payroll was last time? Or am I stuck with the same old payroll number? So I have not seen guidance yet on that particular question. And I think it's a question that needs to be answered. It would be strange to use the same reference period from the beginning of the year um, when you're started talking about a program that's really going to roll out uh, at the beginning of 2021. But 
Um, we've not seen guidance yet, or I've not seen guidance yet on that question. Yeah, and I, I agree with Eric that it, it most likely that in this in that case that your actual triple P loan could be greater this time around than last time because you might have a larger employer payroll uh, wage number to multiply it by. But anyway, we'll wait to see about that. More to come. Okay, whatever. I fell asleep for three months, Eric, or six months, and I didn't get a triple P. And I finally woke up, and now I want one. So I'm a new borrower. How, how does it work for me? So for a new borrower, um, you have a higher cap. It can be up to 500 uh, employees. Now, there's language here that are el have to be a business that's eligible for other small business SBA 7A loans. Um, I do not believe that that means that you would necessarily qualify for that loan, but that, that would be a higher bar if that's the case. And again, we need clarification. It expands who's eligible um, to include sole proprietors, independent contractors, and other um, self-employed individuals, gig workers, uh, for example. So the idea here is to allow those people to continue their um, compensation at the same level um, rather than have them look for other sources of comp such as unemployment. Um, it also includes um, some not-for-profits uh, that have, were not eligible before um, and that is um, a big benefit. And then if you are um, a hotel or restaurant, um, you look at your employee count per location. So if you're a larger operation, but you have um, less than 300 people per, in each location, you would still be eligible for the loan. Again, subject to the two and a half million dollar cap. And Eric, there's the same rules that I had to be in business. I, I can't remember what the date was anymore, but I, I it, say I was somehow, I thought it, it, this COVID-19 thing wasn't going to be so bad. And I started a new business in in July, would I be eligible for this? Again, that's another one where we have to wait for clarification because um, it wouldn't necessarily make sense if you were being logical about it to tie it to being in business um, in the first quarter or in 2019 uh, when you're talking about a program rolling out in 2021, but we have to get additional guidance on that. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so on this slide, I, we really want to focus on the, the two, the, the first two, accommodation, food services, and nonprofits. Unlikely most folks are going to be in the, a large transportation. When that, we think of transportation, we're not thinking of a limo service or Uber driver. We're thinking of major transportation type companies here. And event services, you know, it's more like the Santa Barbara Bowl or, you know, something like that. It's not, it's not an event coordinator type person. So let's, Eric, if you could focus on the first two and what unique things are, are on Triple P are applicable to if I own a restaurant or a catering service, maybe you could help me. So, so the, the big, big difference here is they increase the amount that you can borrow from two and a half times your average monthly wage to three and a half times. And then this goes back to being able to expand the types of expenses you can include as well. And it will provide a big boost for hotels and restaurants and caterers and the like um, by allowing for larger, completely forgivable uh, borrowing, including the expense categories that will make it easier to fully use the funds and achieve that full forgiveness. So this is a big, big win uh, for people in those businesses. Okay, and nonprofits, I guess a few more have been included in their newspapers, radio, television broadcasters. Uh, I guess that is really the big thing. And you know, we have a lot of nonprofits here, so hopefully that can help some folks in this community. Um, anything else on this sheet, Eric? Do you wanna cover anything in transportation or event services? Or well, well, I would say if you're in the event services space um, and you think you fall into one of those buckets, you should speak with uh, a SCORE mentor and get some, input to your specific situation. But if you do hit the criteria, um, there are grants available um, and uh, you only, your hurdle is you'll have to show a 25% reduction in revenue, but given how hard hit uh, venues have been, um, 
that should be uh, easy to do. And if you're a small venue, there's a special amount put aside for venues that have less than 50 employees. But Eric, make sure this doesn't cover, you know, I got a gig on the side that I'm a wedding photographer. It doesn't cover me for that, right? No, this is that you would apply individually for PPP um, and or unemployment or unemployment. Um, this is really for the act, the venues themselves. Okay. And it doesn't apply if I rent chairs and tables to events, right? No. Okay. Let's make sure. Okay. That's great. Next slide, please. EIDL. EIDL is back. Uh, 20 billion allocated for the EID grants and loans. So is it really grants too, Eric? It is grants and loans again. And the grant program um, is intended to go back and, and at least as their initial take, um, eliminate the $1,000 per employee limitation and allow for larger grants. Now, um, maybe I'm jumping ahead of you here, Greg, but the caveat on this is uh, the EIDL is supposed to be targeted uh, to designated geographic areas that are designated to low-income areas, and um, it's not clear how that's going to be interpreted and uh, who will be eligible for this additional batch of EIDL funding. So yeah, Eric, there's probably two things, right? There's a, there's a, we have no, we don't really understand yet the geographic focus and what is considered low, in, low income or highly impacted areas. Um, so that's a question we need to answer. And another thing, there's a, it, it's really for um, uh, diversity and inclusion, right? Uh, uh, areas. Is that, is that correct? Yes. And so, uh, and so there's some rules on this that we're digging deeper into. So stay tuned. We should have more information next week on the EIDL portion of this. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> okay, Eric, this has got to be the best thing. The best thing. We all were hoping for this. You know, it was such, a, such an unusual thing that they gave me this, the, this triple P loan. I got to reduce my salary expenses and my utility bills. But then I couldn't take it off my taxes like I normally do. And so my taxes were going to be much higher. But now, Eric, what did they do for us? They have fixed this, thankfully. And it's been so long overdue and something, yes, as Greg said, we've been waiting for. Um, what this means is that expenses that you paid with PPP funds are treated exactly like any other expense when you're preparing your income taxes. So now when you sit down with your CPA or whoever helps you with your income taxes, you're able to deduct any expense that was a deductible business expense, um, whether or not you use PPP funds to pay for it, which means you get the full benefit of the forgiveness uh, of the PPP loan. So it's a really great thing. And it's probably, I, I, this alone I would have taken even if they had no new P, triple P loans. This is really, really good for everyone. Um, and it will simplify taxes and like, years between forgiveness and not forgiveness. It's, it's, it's a great, great thing. The other thing that, I, Eric, I never could get, maybe I got one or two clients to do this, but you know, it's such a good benefit that you can defer your payroll taxes. And now they've been extended. It used to be only to the end of the year. And now they've extended it. And then you don't have to pay back for like another year. Exactly. And this is this is huge from cash flow because what it means is all of those employer portion of the taxes for that you normally would be paying and filing, you need to still file your form 940 or 941 each quarter, but you can defer the payment. And while the originally the deferment was only for the quarters through the end of 2020, they've added a quarter to that and then they've added a full year. To when you have to pay it back. So um, from cash flow, and I know a lot of businesses have been struggling with cash flow through this, this is a big benefit. And you should make sure you're working with whoever you use for payroll and with your accountant, CPA, to take full advantage of this. And Eric, I don't know how, how you, you've been getting your clients to do this, but this seems just a reluctance. And Eric emphasizes so well that it's very important from a cash flow. It, it, it will put thousands of dollars back in your pocket. Yes, you still do owe it. No, it's not going to be forgiven. You're going to have to pay it. But you know, the best thing you can do with taxes is defer. You're always going to have to pay your taxes at some point. But deferral is what we all try to do when we're 
when we're uh, thinking of taxes. And this gives you to the end of 22, which is like two years. So please look into it. It's really a great thing. This, I don't know how many folks would be on this line that would be uh, uh, eligible for the employee retention tax credit. Are you going to talk a little about that and in the in, in ability to use that with Triple P? So first of all, you cannot use it with Triple P, so, which um, disqualifies taking advantage of the Triple P. And because the Triple P is fully forgiven, um, it's preferable to the tax credit. So if you have a choice, uh, you're almost always, and you should work, look at your particular situation, but you're almost always better off um, using the PPP. Um, this is a very, th these tax credits are very technical and it would be well beyond the scope of this webinar to try to explain them in detail. So if you do think uh, that you're not going to take a PPP and you might be able to use these tax credits, you should talk to your CPA. Okay, great. So why don't we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so for those of you, and I imagine we have a number of folks that have an SBA 7A loan or a 504 micro loan payments. And initially, I think, Eric, they were, ex they were extended six months where the SBA actually paid both principal and interest on those loans to the bank. So you didn't have to pay, I think, for the six months. I think that ended sometime in September. Yes. I and, and so, and then we all had to start paying again, but now they have extended it three months. Exactly. How does that work in, 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 in three months or five months? So maybe you can, first of all, distinguish between three and five. Okay. So, so the, the distinction here, and again, this was to support particularly hard hit industries. So for most businesses, um, you get a three month extension. So another three months where the government is paying your principal and interest and you uh, have your loan amount being reduced as a result of that and you don't have any payments going out. If you're in these certain designated hard hit industries which are food service and accommodations, arts, entertainment and recreation. So, I mean, this we have to get clarification, but I think this would actually include uh, in recreation, health clubs and, and the like, uh, entertainment. Obviously, we talked about venues, um, personal care services. So a massage therapist, for example, that hasn't been able to see clients would be an example here. Then you get five months um, where the, an additional five months where the government is going to pay your principal and interest. So Eric, you know, all these things, all these categories kind of confuse me. Like, I don't really know what art says. I'm a wedding photographer. Do I qualify for the five month extension? So my initial response to that is I would certainly request that we need clarification. Again, as happened with the first go around, the, these bills pass very quickly. They're trying to get them through and then there's going to need to be some interpretation. But my interpretation of this if I had to speculate, is that, yes, these will be um, interpreted fairly broadly to include people that uh, are clearly hard hit. Because the idea here is that it wants to look at the businesses that were most significantly impacted by the downturn. So if you're a wedding photographer and weddings were not happening, um, you know, photography, you would argue, is an art and you would uh, want to uh, look for this additional time period. So, you know, last time I, I, I know that the, um, there seemed to be a lag between the lenders, which is, you know, like American Revere or Montecito Bank of Trust um, and the, this law. So do I call my banker, my lender, like American Revere or Montecito Bank of Trust and say, oh gosh, can I stop payment? Or I've been paying for three months. Are you gonna pay me that money back? Or do, is timing, is that something probably needs to be worked out? Is that best? So I, I, one of the things that is very unclear is whether they're going to go back and do this retroactively to continue from September through the end of the year with that additional time period, or they're going to allow that gap and now start it back up again. Um, what I would say is, and the local banks may not like it that I say this, I would be persistent in checking with your bank because you don't want to be writing checks and sending cash out the door that you don't need to be sending out the door. You want to be doing everything you can to preserve your cash. Um, 
And uh, that would mean trying to take advantage of this as soon as possible. It's the week between Christmas and New Year. So probably the, the bankers are struggling as much as uh, you and I have struggled with this, Eric. So let's give, don't, don't be calling them tomorrow. Let's, let's see if we can wait a week or so and get some results. You know, we will contact the banks ourselves, Eric and I, and hopefully we have an answer for you on next Tuesday so we can, you know, avoid the hundreds of calls into the bank. So let's, maybe that's the best way we can do that. Uh, Fair enough. Anything else on this slide, Eric, that we should talk about? No, I think that that is pretty straightforward. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, so I'm going to do some really fast kind of individual benefit things here because I want to make sure we leave lots of time for, um, for questions. So, and, there, and there's lots of individual benefit things and we're going to go in much more detail uh, next time. But let's start off with one of the better ones, which is this student loan uh, one. And so Eric, tell me about the student loan, please. So this is um, an extension and expansion of the program that lets um, employers pay for uh, tax-free education assistance, which can be include the principal and or interest on uh, a qualified student loan. Um, and they've extended that now all the way out through 2025. So uh, four, four more years. Um, and that's a huge benefit to employees who have outstanding student debt. And it's a very effective way for companies to provide a benefit to their employees um, without having to raise salaries um, or the like. So uh, this is a big win for any company that's in a position to work with their employees and take advantage of it. And the beauty of this is neither the employer nor the employee is taxed on that 5250. So it's a great, great deal. No one pays taxes on that $5,250. So if you're lucky enough to be a doctor and you own a ton of money and you own your own practice and it's set up as a corporation, Make sure you take a $5,250, uh, uh, your corporation pays that every year for you. And if you're not, if you don't own your own place, try to go and negotiate this as a benefit, as Eric said. It's great to your employer. They don't pay any taxes and you don't either. It's, However, worth, more, it's worth more to you than, uh, I, because it's tax-free, it's worth way more to you than if the employer paid you $52,500 or $5,250 as a raise where you'd have to pay tax on that additional income. And it's much less expensive to the company than paying you uh, compensation as wages because they don't have the employer contributions on top of it. So, you know, everybody wins on this. However, I got some bad news. There's always bad news. There's no further student loan relief beyond January 31st of 2021. So, you know, you did have the suspension of, of, of uh, <coughs> options and defaults on loans uh, with 0% 0, 0 interest. That has ended. You know, it was extended by Trump through December 2020. And then it was extended again by Secretary Davos through January 31st of 2021, but it is not extended by this act. So that that has that has ended as of uh, in you know in some thirty some days that will end. So good news, but some some not so great news either. Uh, so let's keep going down here. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay. So this one's this one's a good news bad news story. So for those that have run out of their unemployment, and most of those have run out like at the end of like last weekend. It's been extended well into March now at $300. So the $600 thing was not put back. It was extended through six through $300. And I think this applies, Eric, it's different programs, but it's the same principle, both to gig workers and to uh, regular employees. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Uh, I don't know if there's anything else on that we want to talk about. Is there, Eric? So the only other thing that's important here um, is for gig workers, other independent contractors, there is a provision for an extra $100 a week 
uh, for people who have both wage and self-employment income, um, but their prior unemployment benefit calculation didn't take into account their self-employment uh, income. So there's the potential for those people to have $100 a week they didn't have before as a result of that. Um, and that would be separate from the $300 uh, a week that is the additional supplement to the unemployment coverage. That's hard. Give me a brain cramp, Eric. So definitely talk to a SCORE mentor about that. See if that works for you and how that would apply. Uh, one thing we didn't mention here, and I, I'm going to throw in here now because it is the, hot, the season of giving, is that there's a charitable contribution. And I think a lot of people have missed this. And it's a one-time $300 above the line. And Eric, I'm going to let you explain above the line and below the line. A deduction of cash contributions. And it was for 2020 and it's been extended to 2021. And for joint file, filers, it's increased to 600. So you could do a 300 or 600 this year and you can do a 300 or 600 in 2021. And Eric, tell everyone why above the line and why that matters that it's above the line and what kind of benefit is that to them to be a little more generous this year? So it means that it lowers your taxable income before you do the calculation of taxes owed is a, um, it's, it's effectively a tax credit as opposed to a deduction. Um, and it, whereas a deduction reduces your adjusted gross income and you calculate the tax, this is a deduction off of the taxes owed, straight so off the tax. So if I owe hundred dollars in tax or a thousand dollars in taxes, I get to write off 600 bucks if I'm married immediately. And, 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 and instead of writing off $600 off my income, big deal. So don't overlook that. It's for 2020 and 2021. I think a lot of people don't talk about that much. Um, and uh, so I wanted to make sure we brought that up. The other thing uh, that I thought we don't talk about a lot is that the medical expenses will continue to be, uh, has been restored, I should say, down to 7.5% of the AGI hurdle instead of the 10%. And that's really whether you're itemized or not deduction. I don't know if Eric, if you want to... Talk any more so about if, if you're paying for your own uh, health insurance, as opposed to having health insurance provided by your employer, or you have other medical expenses, um, previously, it, it was that you had to have medical expenses that were above seven and a half percent of your taxable income to be able to deduct those medical expenses. It got raised to 10%, which obviously made the bar higher. And now they've brought it back down to seven and a half percent. This is something you should talk to your tax provider or tax professional about. Um, or if you're doing your own personal taxes uh, through a program, uh, make sure that you're looking for the section that will walk you through health insurance deductions. And if you are itemizing and you are a person that's had uh, any significant uh, medical expenses, you'll want to take advantage of this. So let's go to the next page, Eric. So we continue here, this eviction moratorium. Okay, I think this only applies to my primary resident, not my 10 beach house, is that right, Eric? That is correct. This is for your primary residence, and then there's a bunch of requirements uh, here. And it's been extended through? It's just extended a month. I think everybody was hoping for a much longer extension on this, but as of right now, at least the federal moratorium, is through January 31st. Now the state moratoriums may run longer than that. So um, there, are, there are other potential ways to address your challenges in paying rent. There is a, and this is getting deep into it and we you know, talk to your tax person, real estate person or a score mentor. But if you find yourself in a difficult place where you have to do a short sale, that can sometimes be a taxable event to you unbelievable as it sounds, but there can be. That has, and, and, and some, that has um, been, there was an exclusion this year for that, um, but the, a money, the amount of money you're going to be discharged is going down in 21. But there's some real interesting questions about that and in, 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 in how you can exclude it from your income taxes through 2025. So if you do find yourself in a short sale position, Make sure you seek some legal help from that to understand your tax liabilities issues. 
I don't know, Eric, if you want to say any more on that at all. No, I think that's very complicated and, and you should certainly get help if you're in that situation. Um, okay, this whole thing about assistance and qualifying for unemployment, can you help me through understand what this is, Eric? So there is money available um, to help people in certain categories pay their rent and or housing cost. Um, and they, in implementing the program, want to make sure that it's going to those that are most in need. And so there are these three uh, requirements. You have to meet all of them. Um, the first one is that you have qualified for unemployment or can show uh, a reduction in household income, uh, et cetera, that's directly related to COVID-19. Um, you can show that you're at risk of losing your place of residence. So uh, landlord threatening eviction, a bank uh, threatening foreclosure, et cetera. Um, and then the last one, which is that your household income is below 80% of what the area media, median income is. Um, and so, of course, uh, you have to look at that number for Santa Barbara County um, and do that calculation. Um, and those would be the criteria for being eligible for assistance. And if you think that you qualify and you want help uh, in working through that process, certainly you can reach out and we can, a SCORE mentor could help you uh, with that. So another big individual benefit or company benefit, I guess both, I guess more for a company, is that um, for, but for 21 and 22, the meal deduction is now available again. And it's really to help restaurants. So if you, if you have, if that's a business expense, you can do a hundred percent deduction in 21 and 22 of your meals. So that's uh, out there to help uh, uh, businesses, to help restaurants. The thing we haven't talked about yet, Eric, which is still like this debate in Congress going on is this checks that we're, some of us are gonna get. So this direct payments to Americans. Let's hop uh, to the next slide. Okay, thank you. Uh, sorry, Eric, <coughs> so it's $600 or $600 for a joint. Um, and it could go up. There's a bunch of competing bills in the Senate right now, whether that's gonna go up or not. And it might, it might actually go higher. And what's interesting here, Eric, and maybe you can help me understand that. You know, it, it all relates to how much I made in 2019. And then if I made too much, it goes down. And at some point I don't get anything. And in, in, in 2020, I could still use my in, uh, 2019 number, even if I made more money in 2020, even if I wouldn't qualify in 2020, if my 2019 number works, I still qualify. Is that correct? That is what they are saying at this point, um, and I haven't seen anything to suggest that there's going to be something on your 2020 tax filing that uh, would be a carve back uh, on this if you had money that made you inel enough income in 2020 that made you ineligible. So um, it's an automated process. It's not something you apply for. And the government is going to look at your 2019 returns and decide whether you uh, are eligible. And if you are, it's going to send you the payment. If you're set up for direct deposit for your tax returns, uh, tax payments, it'll come back straight into your bank account. You, you won't, you'll just have to pay attention to see when it shows up. And if not, you'll get a check in the mail um, at some point. Um, and that's, I mean, that's very simple. It'll work the same way as the first one uh, did in that sense. There's one change here that could be positive. And this is all based off of AGI. Um, if I may, if I was not eligible in because of my 2019 income was too high, but because I was in one of those terrible industries, my 2020 income does make me eligible. I can qualify for the second batch of this. And I think, Eric, at that time, what they're going to do is they'll look at your taxes and they're actually give you a credit on your taxes for it. But it'd be Yes, which, we, which if you're in that bucket would uh, mean that you want to file your 20, uh, 20 taxes as early as possible once you have all of the information you need to file. So again, if you, if you did not qualify in 2019 because you made too much, didn't qualify for the first one because you made too much, but now you do qualify because 2020 wasn't such a great year. 
you you can qualify under your 2020 number. They'll look at that number and it will be taken off your taxes. So I think that's a, a real big thing that uh, is important. Um, and do we have any more slides, Eric? Or yes, no? the next slide is the last slide. It's the small oh, business grants. Before we do that, I want to just go over quickly a few things here that we didn't talk about um, and make sure we... Uh, 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 can, uh, uh, you know, have any questions. So they have this energy efficient homes credit and qualified fuel, fuel cell credit has been extended since 2021. That's in the bill. So if anyone's in that uh, bucket, there is um, the, a couple of things that have not been uh, uh, done. We talked about the uh, student loan and there is uh, no hazardous pay, which I know people are talking about for essential workers. That was not in this bill. I think that's, I think, you know, quickly that covers some of the individual ones and we'll do more detail next week. Eric, did you have any other ones you wanted to add? No, I think that's, that's a good first run through and we're going to be seeing a lot more detail come out. And as we did with the first, uh, with the CARES Act and the follow-up, we will do a series of uh, webinars to help people understand and take full advantage of all of these programs, um, starting with another one next Tuesday. Yeah, and what I, what I, what Eric, what Eric and I want to say is, you know, unlike the first one where it seemed like this huge rush to get it, and you know, and you, if you didn't get it quick enough, you know, you were never going to get it, and there was, you know, long lines. Don't worry. First of all, all the big companies that grab so much of the money aren't is not available to them this time. It's a huge, uh, 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 large amount of money that is available. It's anticipated that no one will be left out that wants it. So you don't need to rush. You can take your time, make sure you get a good mentor to work with you and we're there to help you. Another program, Eric, is this California Small Business Grant. And again, this is a program that opens up applications starting tomorrow, December 30th. And the application period is from tomorrow, December 30th into January 8th, and then it closes. It doesn't matter when you get your application in during that time. It's not first come, first serve. It's based on need. And they're not huge grants, but it is absolutely free money. And Eric, maybe you can describe a little about the program and then how do I go about seeing if it works for me or not? Okay. So the program is designed to provide funding for California small businesses most in need um, as a result of the COVID crisis. And um, as Greg said, it, it's not first come first serve. There's a certain amount of money that was allocated uh, to this program. Um, and they're going to look at all of the applications that come in and pay in order of uh, meeting the criteria um, from most suited uh, to least suited. So you wanna take your time, do the application correctly make sure you get it in by the deadline on January 8th. Um, they're going to look at um, the health and safety restrictions uh, in the different geographic areas in California, um, which right now everybody's more or less under the stay at home order. They're going to look at the industry sectors that are most impacted. So again, if you're in a particularly hard hit sector, you're more likely. And then they're going to look and try to help most underserved small business groups. Um, so majority owned and run by women, minorities, uh, veterans, et cetera. Um, and then located in low to moderate income and rural communities. And, and so those are the criteria that will move businesses up higher in the queue. Um, the program is interesting because the state has contracted with a third party to do the application acceptance and review process. And, and we've included a link here to their webpage at the bottom of this slide. When you get to that slide, um, you then apply through a partner. You'll see a menu that says find a partner and you can enter Santa Barbara and it will bring up a list of partners that you can work with. Um, so you'll pick a partner um, and then uh, work through that partner to complete your application. They'll help you get the application done um, and then uh, walk you through the process of submitting it. Um, and then you just sit back and wait.
Do you know how large the grants are? In how, yes. In so, so the grants come in three buckets um, based on the gross revenue, annual gross revenue of the business. If you have at least $1,000 of revenue up to $100,000 of annual gross revenue, the grant amount is $5,000. If you're from 100,000 to a million, the grant amount is $15,000. And if your annual gross revenue is between a million and two and a half million, it's 25,000. And if your revenue is above two and a half million, you're not eligible for the program. Okay. And if I have multiple businesses, do I have to, is it the combined businesses? You get to apply for one of the businesses and you apply for the largest of the businesses, in my understanding. Okay. And do you know what the criteria is? I'm just trying to figure out, should I apply? What, what, if you were going to rank what's most important in this application process, obviously the inclusion and diversity issue is key. Um, and industry sectors would be my sense at this point, because the first one I think of the criteria here is almost a throwaway at this point, given how widespread um, COVID is in the state at, the, uh, at this moment. So I would say um, it's the most impacted industry segments. Uh, if you're a restaurant uh, and if you're a woman or minority owned restaurant, for example, that would probably put you um, pretty high up um, on the uh, list. But it must be, would you say, it must gonna go beyond just restaurants, certainly. Oh yeah, it should go, it should go um, well beyond that. I mean, there's plenty of industry sectors that are impacted. I picked restaurants as an example because here in Santa Barbara, uh, we know that that's one of the most hard hit. Uh, but if you're a professional services or a personal services provider, a hair salon, uh, massage therapist, I mean, those are all been shut down extensively, uh, large impact there. So um, those are the type of things that the program will look at. And, and if you go to this website, there's a very good uh, frequently asked questions section that uh, will help you through that process. And the partners that they have when you pull up the list of partners are all doing webinars um, to answer questions and guide people through the process. So Eric, you know, we all have had uh, clients that, you know, I, I, I own my own business, but it's just me. I don't take a salary because I'm just scraping by, you know, I'm just taking draws. So I didn't qualify for triple P. I then did the, you know, I, I, I did the uh, unemployment. Would I be a key candidate for this since I never qualified for triple P, but I've been devastated by this. I'm the, I'm the wedding photographer guy again. Yes, I think you would be um, a very good candidate for this. So, uh, so if you are one of these folks that you know did not, you know, did not have the wages to qualify for Triple P, or had very little wages for Triple P, um, this might be a very good program for you. And and it is, Eric. It's it's a grant, so I don't have to pay it back, right? That's correct. It's a it's a grant. Okay. Uh, Certainly, I, we encourage you to look at that. If you have any questions, you know, reach out to us or anyone else. And but make sure you get it in before midnight on the eighth. I think Eric, is there anything else we should talk about, or should we start taking? No, some let's go to questions. Alisa, do we have any questions? We have some questions. Yes. Um, so I will roll them into a couple different buckets here. Um, in the order that I received them, so there was a question about the PPP2 and whether the full-time equivalent requirement has been removed from that eligibility. No, the full-time equivalent requirements remain, although with the, we need to see what's in the simplified application for the less than $150,000 loans. My suspicion is it is going to largely eliminate any calculation of FTEs uh, in that, but we need to wait and see. But the, the basics of number of employees still includes a calculation of full-time equivalents. Yeah. Thank you. And so, you know, a lot of it, Eric, I think we would agree on that. It's gonna be driven off your total wage and comp number and that since if it's under that 150, it's, it, it, was, it, you know, it wasn't looked at anyhow. So I think the important part is if you're thinking about getting it is what's my wage and comp number. Thank you so much. Um, there's a question in regard, uh, just 
kind of timing about EIDL, if someone received EIDL, EIDL funding the first round, are they eligible to get a second round of funding? I don't know the answer to that yet. Okay. Yeah, it's going to depend on when we get more information. And that's something we're, we, Eric and I both hope we have a great deal more to talk about next. <coughs> great, thank you so much. Um, some questions in regard to PPP eligibility and whether someone has already received their forgiveness or whether someone has not yet been able to apply for forgiveness. Um, many people are concerned that they actually haven't been given the opportunity to apply for forgiveness from their bank yet. Can you clarify, is it still possible for them to apply for the second round of PPP? Yes, Absolutely. The, the, yeah, the requirement is only that you've used your PPP funds, not that you've applied for or gotten forgiveness. Per perfect. That's, that's a lot of questions on that one. So that's really fantastic. Thank you. Um, also some questions about the, the SBA 7A loan. Um, if, they, if they currently have payments for that loan on hold, um, will, will the government still pay the principal and interest as you described? I think I, I need a little more information of why they have it on hold. What's the issue? Eric, I don't know what you would say to that. Now, without more information, I mean, the basic prem premise is the government is going to pay amounts that are due, uh, including principal and interest. If um, the loan is on hold uh, only in that the lender is agreeing to defer um, payments, but is still continuing to accrue interest, then I would think the answer is yes, this should apply. Um, if there are other circumstances um, I, that are more specific to an individual situation, you probably need to talk to your bank. So, yeah, I, and I, you know, the banker is going to be very reasonable. I mean, the banker might have put it on hold because you're unable to pay, but you, what you want to say to the banker, take me off hold for three months. <laughs> let me, let the government pay my principal interest. You'll be better off. I know I'm better off and then put me back on hold. <coughs> and if that's the situation, uh, but if you're completely on hold and you have nothing due, the government's not gonna step in and pay. Thank you very much. Um, all right, bear with me just a moment here. There are some questions regarding to businesses that have very minimal revenue in 2020 or started operating in 2019 and therefore um, don't, can't really demonstrate a 20% further reduction quarter over quarter um, for PPP. Do you have recommendations for them? Can they use the list the last two months of the year or does it have to be a full quarter for that 25% reduction? So my, I, I, my argument would be that if you're you had two months in the fourth quarter of 2019, you have a quarter, you have quarterly results. You didn't have any revenue in October, but you still have revenue for the three month period combined. Um, so I think that that is reasonable, but I, we need to get, see a little bit more guidance on that. Um, and then of course you'd have to compare that to the fourth quarter of this year and this year would have to be down 25% from that number. So um, you still have to clear that hurdle. Yeah, and I wanna make sure I understood the question. You, you cannot pick just two months. You can't, you, 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 a quarter's a quarter, it's 13 weeks. You can't say, well, I'm gonna pick these eight weeks of it and kind of do my own period, period comparison. Um, so I think the rule is gonna be hard on that. If you have numbers for a quarter over quarter, I mean, year over year quarter analysis, you're gonna to have to use those numbers. Okay, great, thank you. Um, here. Um, so some questions again about forgiveness and timing of forgiveness. They're wondering, I guess it sounds like perhaps we don't know this yet, but is it possible to get both loans forgiven at the same time if they got both the PPP and the PPP two? Is it better just to wait to apply until both of them are eligible for forgiveness? Do you have any recommendations on that? I can't see a scenario where it would make sense to wait to apply. Um, they're going to be treated and analyzed separately for having met the forgiveness period for the applicable covered period for the two separate loans. So um, waiting now that you've finished uh, your first PPP, 
to first then start a second PPP period um, would not be a good idea because it's possible you'll start to bang up against the requirement to file for forgiveness within 10 months of having completed your first one. I'm going to say what I said probably eight months ago or six months ago, whatever the right period is. When the government's handing out free money, stick out your hand. Great, thank you. Um, a couple of questions in regard to the student loan payment of um, 5250. Um, the, people are wondering, is this possible regardless of whether they get a PPP2 loan? And is the timing of that in 2020 or in 2021? There's some confusion in regard to that. So it has nothing to do with the triple P2.0. Okay. And it is for, it, it lasts until 2025. Okay. So you get a five year period, you can use that. Perfect. And it's an, that amount is annual. So, so 20, you know, what's that 26,000 and some change, Eric? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Um, questions from somebody, whether the new, the PPP2 and the, um, the, the California grant can be used together. There's no dependencies on those, is that correct? To my knowledge, those are two separate they're programs. They're administered by one by the federal government uh, through your bank and the other through the state, through this uh, organization they've contracted with. So there's nothing explicitly prohibiting you from having PPP money and applying for the California grant. Great, thank you so much. Um, just a, a few more to go through here. Um, bear with me just another second. Bear with me, sorry. Just... Hey, Eric, question for you as we're waiting for another question. You know, I was surprised, or maybe you can tell me why, or maybe I just misread it. I thought retail, brick and mortar retail, you know, I'm a clothing store. I thought they would have gotten a, a, a special break here, but I guess there's no, they're not identified as a hard hit industry. Is that right? I have not seen anything to suggest they are, no. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a shame as I walk down, down State Street and see all the boarded up stores. They sure could use help. Yes. All right. Thanks for the little um, respite there. So, so in terms of, um, again, for forgiveness, um, there are some questions in regard to if, if, if someone still has not applied for forgiveness for the first round of PPP loans, would the guidelines from our previous webinar still apply for that? Or are you anticipating any changes for that forgiveness process? Uh, other than the simplified application for loans up to $150,000 that we're waiting to see, mm -hmm. um, that's that's the, the big change, um, and that should make people's life easier, not more complicated. The rest of the general guidelines that we've discussed would apply, and as we mentioned at the beginning, um, there are some additional categories of expenses that uh, you can look to, but if you've already met your forgiveness criteria, you don't want to go back and reopen that. Uh, process of calculating your expenses. You've already done it. So you don't, there's nothing that changes there. And, and, and I know there's been a few questions uh, surrounding this. I'd say the vast majority, in fact, I'd say probably, you know, maybe as, as, as less than 25% people have applied for forgiveness. So don't feel if you haven't applied, you're like way behind the eight ball or anything else. I think you're in the, the majority of folks that have not applied. I know we spoke to Montecito Bank and Trust the other day, and I think they had 10 or 11% of their folks have applied only. Great, thank you so much. Are, are you both available for just a few more questions? Yes. Okay, yes. Great. All right. Um, question for PPP2 is a requirement that if you have used the PPP1 loan, sorry, I'm trying to rephrase this. For PPP2, is there a requirement that you use the PPP one loan for any certain in any certain way? I guess they're asking, have you used the PPP one loan for forgivable uses? Is that an eligibility requirement for PPP two? I, I'm afraid I may not understand that question. Okay, so so if the question is um, if you didn't meet the forgiveness requirement or the requirements for full forgiveness on PPP one. Are you still eligible to apply for PPP2? Um, we would need clarification on that, but I did not see anything anywhere that suggests that failure to achieve full forgiveness 
on PPP1 would disqualify applying for PPP2. It just means you're going to have a PPP1 loan balance outstanding. Yeah, I would agree with Eric, especially this is really focused on you know, the hard hit places like restaurants, which many restaurants did not um, you know, qualify for 100% forgiveness for the triple P initial loan. So I, I, I don't, I think you still would be able to. The interesting question, Eric, is can I use, I don't think I can <laughs> triple P2 to pay off triple P1. No, that's not a permitted use of the, uh, or permitted expense uh, under the program. Okay, great, <laughs> thank you. Um, question, if, if someone didn't file a tax return for 2019, but if they're getting social security, would they still receive a stimulus check? Are you aware of that, anything around that? My understanding is that yes, the government intends to go back and find people that fall in that category. Um, how effectively they do it and what the process will be remains to be seen. Okay, thank you. Um, wondering, someone's wondering if they need to have a W-2 payroll in order to qualify for PPP, excuse me, PPP-2. No, they've specifically made it available to sole proprietors, uh, independent contractors, um, and you you will do it off of your reported income, your net income on line 31 of your Schedule C to do the calculation. So Eric, let's just talk about that for a minute. We know we've talked about this before. So Schedule C, line 31, and you take that line and you multiply that by 2.5. Is that correct? Uh, you divide it by 12 and oh, then multiply yeah. it by 2.5, yes. Thank you, thank you. Um, I believe that you've covered this in the PPP forgiveness um, webinars, but someone's asking if an employee left by their own choice and gave notice, how do you account for that in PPP forgiveness? So you treat them as if they had stayed um, and you count them both as an FTE um, at the same level and their salary as if it was paid for purposes of use of funds. Um, you do want to have documentation in writing that they voluntarily resigned and uh, that you you can document that. And just to give you, then go back and look at the prior webinar, but if uh, you terminate someone for cause, um, you have the same exception that's available uh, for that. And if you attempt to rehire someone that you laid off before you got the PPP and they declined to come back, that applies as well. Thank you. Um, and then a question about the 25% gross revenue, excuse me, gross revenue decline for the first round of PPP loans. Um, there's some confusion about th if this is a requirement for forgiveness and if so, which quarters, years should the person be comparing? So Greg, you want to take this or me to take it? No, go ahead, Eric, please. Okay, so the this is not to do with the initial PPP loan and or forgiveness. It's a qualification for being eligible for PPP2 if you have a PPP1 loan. So what you need to show is that any quarter in 2020, your gross revenue is at least 25% lower than the same quarter in 2019. And that's a qualification for getting more money. It's got nothing to do with the forgiveness criteria. Yeah, and it goes back it to- it is applicable only if you got the first PPP, is that correct? That's correct. If you didn't get an initial okay. PPP, um, the, that does not apply, or at least yeah. that's what they're saying so far. And uh, at least, think, <laughs> uh, at least uh, think of this as a needs test to get, triple P2 for if you got triple P1. So really, it's really to make sure you need the money since we already gave you some money. Perfect. And hopefully that helps. Um, and I, I would say if, if there's still a question on that, please reach out and ask for a mentor because um, I know that is a bit confusion, confusing there. Um, and then the last question I have that, that just came in was in regard, again, to unemployment. Um, question about unemployment, PECU and Fed ad extensions. There's, they're wondering, are these retroactive? My UI and extensions expired last month's month. Will they be restarted? So the the answer on that one is we still need guidance from the state at this point on how the state, the EDD, is going to 
implement these federal rules. Um, it is likely to be restarted the whether it will be retroactive and cover the gap period um, is not clear to me at least at this point. And again, uh, the Fed federal government passes this law and then hands it off to the states to administer and the EDD has to go through and figure out how it's going to do that. Hopefully, because they've done this once already, it will be a more efficient, uh, timely process than it was the first time around. Yeah, I'm not sure if it's if it, he lost it, if she lost it last month, but for anyone that stopped on last Saturday or Sunday, I can't remember which, I think it was Saturday. Saturday, Saturday. Saturday night. Um, there will be no, that will certainly go retroactive the past four yes. or five days or whatever it takes. So for those folks, if you're in that shoe and, and you got stopped on Saturday night, you're going to get that money that it will go back to a $300, not the 600, but it's been 300 for a while now. Anyhow. Thank you. And then last question was in regard to the EI, EIDL grants and loans. Can you perhaps just go over again the distinct, the difference between the two? Sure, so um, the EIDL program had two components. There was, or there is, since it's back in effect, an emergency grant, which is not a loan, it's an outright payment with no obligation to repay of up to $10,000. Um, and then there's the loan. Um, so when you apply for the EIDL, you apply through an online process and you select that you'd like the grant. Um, you don't hear anything else. Uh, and that grant uh, just appears in your bank account. Uh, and then if you're approved for a loan, it'll move forward and you'll actually be told how much you're approved for. And if you go to the web page, follow the link and it selects the amount, um, you select the amount and then there's loan documentation and you have an, a loan that's a 30 year, 3.75% loan and 30 years on a business loan is amazing. And 3.75% for 30 years is even more amazing. Um, but that's a loan that you then will repay uh, monthly over the term of the loan. Thank you. Um, sorry, and then a, another question just came in um, in regard to the 7% in medical deductions, if that includes insurance costs. Yes, health insurance premiums are included in determining uh, your total medical expenses that are covered uh, in that calculation, the 7.5%. Yeah, Thank you, Eric. Thank you. And then, sorry, just one more slipped in. Um, if you received an EIDL grant and a PPP loan, do you have to give back the EA, EIDL grant? No. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, and that does take us to the end of the questions. There, there are more questions in regard to process and some of the other things, but I, I believe that you did note that there's not a lot of information on those things now. So perhaps you can talk a little bit about the topics you'll discuss next Tuesday. Yes, yeah, so I think next Tuesday, uh, and, and thank you for all attending. Next Tuesday, we're going to go in much greater detail about it. We'll talk about some of the process issues and have more explanations. So I think it's really important to attend if you're able to. And it's next Tuesday. Uh, uh, Elisa, is that 5 p.m. again? Yes, it is, 5 p.m. And um, registration will open for it just about an hour after this. I just have to set up the registration, but it'll be available on our website. And we'll also um, include a link to it in the email we send with the presentation materials. And it's really going to be, you know, an extension and expansion of what we talked about tonight. So we're going to cover new material in more detail with more helpful hints how to, how to, how to proceed. So we really encourage you, uh, you know, that it is not the same repeat. Both Eric and I, we can't do the same thing over again, can we, Eric? No, that's what the recorded playback is for. <laughs> so um, so please attend next. And thank you very much for attending tonight. Uh, I know it's a, a, a hard time of the year to get folks to come, but and we sure appreciate your attending. Good night, everyone.